There are very few things that are certain in life. Even the thoughts we have that are true, to, to what extent are they really true? If you think of truth as being a correspondence between the thought and the thing it represents, each thought is just a sketch. There's no one thought that can comprehend all the many levels of truth out there. It's always just an approximation. For the, so the question is, is that to what extent is approximation useful? And it still leaves a lot that where it doesn't really correspond to things. But there's one thing you can really be certain about, and that's when there's suffering and when there's not. You don't have to ask. If you experience it, you know. And it's right there that the Buddha staked all of his teachings, suffering arising, suffering passing away. And everything else he taught is arranged around that, even right view is right to the extent that it helps put an end to suffering. Your thoughts are skillful or unskillful. Your words and your deeds are skillful or unskillful depending on the extent to which they put an end to suffering. So always keep this principle in mind as thoughts come in and out of your mind. You may have heard that the Buddha taught say that there is no self. Well, to what extent is the not-self teaching skillful, and where is it not skillful? That's the question he would have you look at. There are a lot of things that could be true, but they might, may not be the right time for those things. The Buddha has a teaching on right speech where he talks about speech can be true or not true, beneficial, not beneficial, welcome or unwelcome. And he would speak only, he would speak only those things that are true and beneficial. And that's for things that are welcome or not welcome, he said he'd look for the right time and place. And the same principle applies to our thoughts. There's a time and a place for different thinking. There are times when having a strong sense of self is very useful, very beneficial, and other times when it's precisely the thing that gets in the way. And the question is, how do you know? And the answer is, through trial and error. something that we don't like to hear. We'd like to have a nice formula set out. And the Buddha sometimes does set out the formula for us. But a more important process is to gain a sensitivity. To our thoughts and to their results. When you think something, what happens? And particularly to what extent does it cause stress or not? That's what you've got to look into, and that's why we're meditating here, to get a greater sense of sensitivity to what's causing stress in our minds, and to seeing how it's not necessary, seeing how we can let go of the cause. And when there seems to be relief, okay, watch it for a while, because there may still some, be some stress in there. The Buddha maps things out. Even in terms of right concentration, there are levels of stress. So just because the mind seems still doesn't mean that the job is done. Or there may be a great sense of luminosity or a great sense of strong awareness. Well, the job may not be done. We've got to learn how to look.
I've known people who've you know, been through the sort of training that gives them a lot of self-esteem. And the problem with that is it teaches them not to learn how to judge the results of their actions. Everything they do is supposed to be good, it's a cause for self-esteem, and they may be doing a lot of harm. So the important thing is for them to learn how to be sensitive to that harm. And it's the same with the practice. When you do something, look for the results. When you say something, look for the results. When you think something, look for the results. When you work with the breath, look for the results. Breath training is an especially good way to be taught how to be sensitive to what your thinking produces. There are different ways of focusing on the breath. There are different ways of conceiving the breath. There are different ways of dealing with the hindrances. And your job is to learn how to be sensitive to the results of those things and to figure out okay, which way of focusing is right for right now, which way of thinking is right for right now. Which way of being still is right for right now? And there are some guidelines. But the most important thing is that you learn how to judge for yourself. Because without that sensitivity, there's no way you're going to see the really sensitive levels of stress in the mind. So this is the important part about being observant. When the Buddha talks about mindfulness practice, he places a lot of emphasis on alertness. And the few places where he actually defines alertness, it's being alert to what you're doing. With the body, when you move your hand, be alert to the fact that you're moving your hand. When you look left, look right, be alert to the fact that you're doing that. And then on into the mind. When there are feelings, be alert to what you're, you're doing in the feeling, in the perception, in the thought fabrication, in the consciousness. Because each of these things has an element of fabrication in it. The Buddha says there's a potential, say, for the experience of form, a potential for a particular type of feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness. But these potentials become actual only through your fabrication, through your uh, contribution, through intention. Do you ever notice that? Do you see it happening? If you can't yet see it happening, look, and look at what you can see that you're adding to the, the present moment. And be sensitive to any sense of stress that's there, and see what you can do to minimize the stress. Because only when you learn how to minimize the stress that you can see do you start becoming sensitive to the more subtle levels. So what you're learning is learning how to be a connoisseur of your actions. And particularly a connoisseur of events in the mind. The connoisseur has a very refined palate, say, the connoisseur of food, or music has a very refined ear. What you're trying to do is learn how to be very refined in your sensitivity to what's going on in the mind. It requires a whole cluster of mature attitudes towards when you do things right and when you do things wrong. So that you can learn from when you've done things right and when you've done things wrong. If you get depressed over a mistake, that's unskillful. Notice that. If you get careless after doing something right, well, notice that as well. And the Buddha doesn't tell you not to take pride in being skillful 
actually a sense of pride and not a sense of satisfaction when you've done something right is an important inducement on the path. It gives you the juice you need to keep going. So you've got to be sensitive to where that sense of pride turns into carelessness. The same when you do things wrong. You do have to recognize you've made a mistake, but you can't let that become debilitating. Again, learn to be sensitive to the spot where a recognition of a mistake leads to unskillful reactions. And as you get more sensitive to the results of your actions and more sensitive to the alternatives that you have, you don't have to follow through unskillful patterns of thought. As the Buddha said, if you had to stick with the patterns or habits you already had, there'd be no need to teach you. I mean, no reason to teach you. It wouldn't do any good. He says, it's because people can learn to be more skillful. That's why I taught. To learn to be alert to what you're doing, alert to the results of what you're doing. Even a simple thing like focusing on the breath is an important way to develop your powers of judgment, to learn to be a connoisseur of your breathing, and then a connoisseur of the thinking that goes around the breath. That's when you find yourself arriving at something that really is certain, even more certain than the arising and passing away of suffering. It's the total ending of suffering. That's when you know for sure that you've done things right. There's nothing more certain than that.